Hi everyone, welcome to our um, final um, 2021 Jean Jacobs lecture. Um, I am Maria McDonald, the Executive Director from the Center for the Living City. Today we have a wonderful discussion, the architecture of collective intimacy. We have um, a discussion led by Teresa Kang Wang and Liz. Ogbu is a conversation between dear friends about care, connection, and beloved community in the public realm. We're really excited to have Teresa and Liz here. It's going to be a wonderful conversation between very dear friends. And um, I'm going to introduce both of them and then they're gonna do their friend introduction so they can give you a little history on how they got to, to be here. And, um, and then they're gonna talk for about 45 minutes and then at the end, we're going to take questions. So those of you who are joining us, please, in the chat, as they are talking, send in your questions and we'll keep track of them. And at the end, we'll, we'll have some time for questions and answers. I also want to say thank you to Marywood University School of Architecture for hosting our event with, in conjunction with the American Institute of Architects, um, Northeastern Pennsylvania chapter. And we are also keeping track of the AIA for credits for this lecture. So first I'm going to introduce Teresa Theo. Teresa is a community engaged architect, educator, and facilitator. She has spent over 15 years focused on equitable cultural and community development across the United States. She is the founder of Department of Places, a participatory architecture practice based on occupied Tongva land Los Angeles, California. Additionally, she directs the Design Your Futures Forum, a national anti-racist design education in initiative. Teresa, thank you so much for being here. And Liz. Liz is a designer, an urbanist, and spatial justice activist. Liz is a global expert in engaging and transforming unjust urban environments. From designing shelters for immigrant day laborers in the US, to a water and health social enterprise for low-income Kenyans. Liz has a long history of working with communities in need to leverage the power of design to catalyze community healing and foster environments that support people's capacity to thrive. She's the founder and principal of Studio O, a multidisciplinary consultancy that works at the intersection of racial and spatial justice. Liz, thank you so much for being here. So I am going to disappear. And I'm going to let Teresa and Liz do what they do best and, and talk about all their amazing work that they do together. And, and um, we can't wait to, to jump in again at the end here. Welcome. Great, thank you, Maria. Um, thank you, Chelsea. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you um, to everyone that has shown up. Um, I, I know we can't really see you all, but um, we know that you're there. So thank you for just being a part of our conversation today. Um, I'm excited, I'm excited to just, uh, I don't know, spend an hour together. I, I think it was helpful to, I was joking with um, Liz that it felt like our friendship needed a bio. <laughs> um, and I think it gives us a little bit of context of why this conversation is meaningful, but it's also just a, a tiny little sliver in, in sort of a larger narrative. And so I met Liz almost 20 years ago, September, 2003 when I started grad school um, at Harvard GSD. And it was, um, it was quite a time. I think at that point, it was really intimidating to walk into a space and learn architecture for the first time. I, I you know, did not study it as an undergrad and I felt like a fish out of water. And I remember um, searching for my people and it was, I think in the first few weeks of school and all the student organizations were having meetings. And of course, I walk into the Students of Color Association. Liz is one of the lead organizers. And you sort of walk in. I took a deep breath. I'm like, here's a home. And so I think that was the first time I met Liz. And just immediately, there was resonance. Um, a lot of our work was rooted in community. It was rooted in um, really thinking about the cultural and, I think, social context of architecture outside of just sort of aesthetic and, and form making. And then since then, I mean, I feel thankful to have someone to walk alongside really rethinking what our design practice can be. And so um, 
yeah, from like, I call it my freshman year of grad school to now um, in our forties, we have, we have come quite a long way. And so I just feel honored to be able to have this conversation together. Is there anything you wanna chime in about just our, our history context? The only thing I would say, which I think you framed it up beautifully. The only thing I would add is I feel like at the GSD, not only were we a fish out of water, but I think both of us commented of feeling like black sheep because we were running against the grain of what the, the sort of typical and expected definition of what architecture was and also what we should be aspiring to be as architects. And so I kind of see us as comrades in arms of moving against the grain and, and turning the tide, if you will, because I think now we both have also had this experience where we've gone from being sort of the, the black sheep of the profession to the ones people are like, wait, how do you do this? And so I think it takes a lot to step outside of the norm and so I think part of the texture of our friendship has also been like, you shouldn't be doing that alone. And mm -hmm. so we have found community with each other and others who might be on this call or just in our broader community who together we've all been like trying to turn the tide of what it means to practice design and what it means to, to care for community with design. And I think a lot of um, what we've done is also create spaces that um, we couldn't see ourselves in and then um, make those spaces. And so Design Futures Forum is actually a space that Liz and I continue to um, practice in. Um, I think that's a really important space where uh, you have not only professional collaborators, but um, people who can hold you accountable professionally, but like with love. And so um, I bring that up because we do a lot of facilitation work and because we do hold a lot of conversations uh, it's helpful, especially if we're, we're talking about what intimacy actually is, being a little bit more explicit about what it means to be in, in a shared space. And so I'm going to drop into the chat um, what we call community agreements or really just invitations, invitations of um, awareness and intentionality of how we're going to um, be guiding our, our actions, our speech, but also the way that we want to listen. And so um, these are borrowed from design futures, and these have been sort of amassed over the many years. Um, but I'm just going to uh, go over them really briefly. And I know folks, I love someone's already in the chat. Um, even though we can't see you, we know that you're there. And so we just, again, want to be um, a little bit more intentional about what it means to uh, be in a question answer, in a listening space, or in a chat space. And so first and foremost, you have to take care of yourself. Hopefully we've all learned this lesson in quarantine and during the pandemic. Um, do what you need to do um, in order to be present for and show up for others. Um, just listen actively and with compassion. Uh, we want to ask you to actually self-moderate your participation. So right now, I think the chat is the most public space. And so we want to invite folks to sort of chime in, but also be aware of beware of what your footprint is. And so if you want to uh, make space for other folks to chime in, or if you feel like, you know, there are really things that you feel like you can contribute, uh, we invite you to uh, share that offering as well. Um, just always speak from your lived experience. This is a space for you to tell your own story or your own experience um, and never tell anyone else's story. Um, and sort of uh, thinking about our, our conversation is all about intimacy. And so this is one of the most important things that I feel like a pattern I've broken from grad school is that your emotions and your feelings are as important as intellect. And so in these types of spaces, how you feel is valid and you don't need to sort of prove it. And we just invite you to sometimes lead with the heart. Um, and then the last one is really think beyond binaries, right? So in addition to just uh, racial binaries, black and white, or uh, gender binaries of man or woman, really think about what is what is both and. How do you uh, hold multiple um, intersections of not only identity, but also ways of thinking at once? Um, and so we hope that can also offer a space of um, more kindness, um, courage. We need a lot of courage these days. Um, and then, yeah, hopefully growth. Hopefully at the end of our hour, we all feel a little bit um, like we've stretched out a little bit. Anything you want to add related to invitations? No, or, I think that that's perfect. Okay, we're going to go soon. And so we really just want to start jumping into this conversation. Um, I think when, when Stephen first approached with, 
you know, can we're, we're trying to put together a lecture. I was like, oh, I don't really do lectures anymore. I think really during quarantine, um, I have just been sitting in circle. And um, I'll, uh, to be honest, just, just wanted to be um, under the radar. I think for a moment, um, taking space away from, I guess, prioritizing my pro professional identity and really um, prioritizing not only my, my individual identity, but my, my family life was really, really important. And so I started to think, I'm like, well, I don't have anything to say. You know, I've been in hiding for two years. Um, but I started to really think during the course of the pandemic with so much physical isolation, right? Quarantine re required us to really um, create just spatial isol isolation. Um, I started to really revisit what it meant to be in relationship, especially as uh, you know, you, you got out of your immediate germ bubble and you started to maybe see friends, whether it was physically distanced or masked. And so for me, this intentionality as it related to what it meant to be in physical shared spaces again, um, presence, what physical presence meant started to take on a whole new meaning. And so I think in, in the course of quarantine, relationship building became sort of my biggest space of design intervention and sort of the hyper awareness around consent, around um, sustainability, but also like um, how are we sort of like nurturing, nourishing and, and watering each other became really important. And so intimacy became something that I began to expand a, a personal definition of, you know, beyond just sort of either familial or romantic connotations, really thinking about what it meant to um, feel a sense of deep, deep intimacy amongst friends. And that started to just um, redefine the way that I wanted to uh, think about my practice, because for me, it became a space of just um, I would say just transformative connection. And for, and then that just opened up a space of, of personal growth that I don't think um, I could have done without this feeling of shared intimacy with, with sort of my deepest friends. And so really thinking about how does that scale, right? How does that scale to a, a community or neighborhood level or you know thinking about land or ecosystem? And so um, Liz is a dear, dear friend that, um, I got through quarantine with, you know, both virtually and then the few moments of sort of physical connect connection that we're able to um, connect with. And so it was like, who else but Liz to really think about um, collective intimacy in, in the public realm. And so that's sort of why this conversation, um, as quarantine started to open up, really thinking about how we can continue that intentionality of relationship building that we have you know, created in, in sort of like the, the pods that we, um, the germ pods or you know, household pods that you have been in, really thinking about how that continues as we expand back into sort of, um, I don't even wanna say normal, but just external life. And so, that's sort of, I think, where we're going to start with and um, just continue. Yeah, I mean, I'll just add, I, I feel very much that um, what you articulated is also very true for me and that there is something about the pandemic and it's, it slowed time in a way and it allowed this spaciousness to ask certain questions about things that I think we never questioned before. And so I, I think that this, this idea of what are we, who are we in relationship with and what does it mean to be in relationship and that that's not something that we just like sort of happy to go lucky, go along with whatever comes, but that like we be intentional about it and, and have agency around it, I think is something that is is super compelling. And I, you know, Arundhati's Roy, Arundhati Roy's essay last summer, The Pandemic is a Portal, continues to reverberate with me. And this idea that uh, this invitation not to return to normal or to understand that normal did not work for a lot of us. And so that same agency with which we've been exploring these questions individually and together over the course of the pandemic, I think also it's the invitation to still maintain that same agency as we think about how do we move forward, right? Like that we are not returning back, we are choosing to step into something that would work collectively and individually for us. 
So um, one of the things when Teresa and I were talking about how we wanted to do this conversation, we basically thought, you know, in the spirit of not working with like assumptions that everybody is on the same page, that it would be helpful to start with the definition of intimacy and, and not necessarily say, oh, we automatically have a shared definition of intimacy, but for each of us to articulate what intimacy means to us. So I'll start. And I would say that as I was trying to think about how I would define intimacy, what came to mind, I was actually inspired by two, two different quotes. Um, the first is from Prentice Hempel, who has what has become the now famous quote that boundaries are the distance um, from which I can love you and me simultaneously. And <clears throat> excuse me, the other one um, to paraphrase is from Eddie Glaud, who talked about the idea of justice not being a, a destination, mm -hmm. but actually a practice. And so as I thought about how I wanted to define intimacy, I think it had to do with the fact of understanding that any definition of intimacy must locate us, me as an individual within it, instead of just externalizing about what it means to the other people, and that I have to think of intimacy in terms of it's not a one and done thing. Like, ooh, you and I met, had this relationship, we created intimacy and we're good, right? Like that actually it's something that we have to work towards. So the definition I have is that intimacy at its best is an active practice to have proximity and spaciousness in how we hold our vulnerability, hopes and fears within ourselves and with others. And I think with underneath all that, it's about agency and also an idea of nurtured risk that mm -hmm. it, it's not a safe space, but it is, it is one that welcomes us if we are able to hold those things. What do you got? I love that. I love um, nurtured risk as being an outcome of intimacy. Um, beautiful. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> um, you know, I think I started, I wanted to just really think about the qualities. Um, for me, the sort of the, I don't even know if they're preconditions, but the characteristics are um, open heartedness, right? right? And then it's that open heartedness that leads to deep connection. And then from that connection creates resonance. And for me, resonance is that sort of attunement and sort of shared understanding. And the, I think the foundation that you, uh, lies underneath all of that, like you said, is this idea of safety. And so for me, safety needs to be a process that is self-determined and self-defined. And um, uh, we've had so many conversations around, around trauma and really the idea of um, how, do, how do you self-regulate? How do you create self-awareness so that when you are in moments where you could potentially shut down from either um, you know, a remembrance of past trauma or in a, in a current situation. Um, for me, I started to really think about understanding deeply what it means for me to feel safe in my own body was something that I actually never learned. You know, it took me through, I mean, I, I, to be honest, I don't think I had an embodied understanding until I reached my 40s of, of what it meant to really feel secure and safe in my body because, um, it is it, there has been so much externalizing of things. And so I think revisiting a lot of practices that make me understand sort of like, so for me, intimacy is a space where I'm like, oh, right? Like my shoulders are down, mm -hmm. like there is an immediate release in my body. And so it, it, a lot of times we, I think, categorize it as a, a emotional space, but really like once the body is involved, I'm like, okay, that's when I know that there's the space for then the deep connection. And the deep connection, I think is, is that sort of co-nurturing um, that creates the uh, possibility for, for the new new, right? The, the um, for me, intimacy, because it also is like a space that is sort of, I wanna say like scary, but in the best way, I feel like that's when you're at your edge, right? When we're at an edge and we're about to, that's that's the expansion of like, the, you know, the wings need a little bit more space. And, and what I'm realizing is that it needs to be in relation for me to be able to stretch out, right? So a lot of the self cocooning happens, um, but it needs to be um, also the the possibilities, right? Scale when, when um, it's either with other another person or uh, you know in community 
um, and then hopefully even even on on, on the scale when we were having. Yeah, no, I love that. I, I love, especially you and I have both been on a sort of journey of understanding embodiment and somatic. So uh, that really resonates with me. And um, I had flagged a quote that I found um, as I was like preparing for this. And I was like, I don't know if this will come in handy, but like, and as you were talking, I'm like, oh, see that quote, it does come in handy. Um, it's from Anais Nin. And it says that, and the time came when the risk to remain tight in a bud was more painful than the risk it took to blossom. And so I think that like this idea of like the safety and the willingness to sort of say, it's not that like it's safe in terms of nothing possibly can happen. I've dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's, but this idea that like, I believe where we can get to is worth the risk. Mm -hmm. And I'm willing to step into that, to that space. And I think, where the embodiment is really interesting and holding as part of that is that part of that is understanding where you are personally, right? Like I can't say that I am ready to risk. And I often think people don't risk in part because they're very out of touch with physically how they feel. And so they default to logic, which is what we have been taught in this society is what you use to make all sorts of decision-making. And so this idea of getting deep in your body, which I actually think means also deep in your vulnerability which almost seems scarier, but I actually think as you discussed, it's like the keys to liberation, right? And so when we think about it in the context of our work, I think I remember being taught of thinking of architecture as an analytical exercise, right? The, do all of these things fit together? Have I drawn the line correctly? Do I understand what needs to fit into this space? Am I taking the client, usually the person who's cutting the check, taking their desires and their brief into to consideration? And so if we are to like move this idea of intimacy at the level of, of the practice that we do, this idea of vulnerability, which is not just, you know, I think part one is the vulnerability of the folks that we are um, designing with and for, and it never, I just actually had a call with a student earlier today and, and she was say, asking me, how do you get um, folks to believe that there's actually power and expertise in what community members are saying? And one of the things that I was saying is like, part of it is understanding that everybody has to be vulnerable in this process, right? Like both the person who has hired me needs to be vulnerable and understanding that the, the only way this works is if they get in relationship with, with this person. And so they can't treat it as like, this is my brief, this is my budget. <laughs> they have to really inhabit what it is that they're trying to create. And that I, that I also appreciate that there's vulnerability on the side of the community members who are impacted by my actions and often get no power in a typical process to determine their fate. Mm -hmm. And if I were to imagine in my own body how that would feel if everybody else gets to choose what happens to me in the places in which I live and my and my family, but myself, like just the thought of it right now is making me feel tight in my body and apprehensive and go into, you know, the fight or flight mode. I'm like defensive, like it's survival. How do I articulate that? And so it's only through this understanding of your your body your vulnerability and willing to hold the space of intimacy where that is okay and that is actually what we lead with to understand how we relate to one another and relate to what we're going to create i don't know how we create good projects unless we are able to do that yeah absolutely i mean i think within the context of reevaluating the way i i build relationships um and pushing it through um um I get, you know, we, we, I don't even know the way to phrase it, but, you know, we talked about how relationship building is a design process. And so I also just started to realize how um, a lot of my relationships were just unintentional or um, just status quo, right? And, or a, it was at a default setting. And so when it became, I became a, a hyper aware of around, um, the way that you need to be able to nurture, but also reach out, you know, create, um, extend, um, invite, respond, um, sustain in order for relationships to really begin to flourish. Um, 
so part of the reframe in my head was what if the design process was less about the, the, the development of, you know, sort of the object or the product or the deliverable um, and, and really refocus the design process as how do we strengthen the relationships between all the people involved, right? Totally. And so I think that's the way that we sort of differentiate uh, a community engaged design process or social impact um, from sort of a more traditional um, design process. And, you know, let's just be honest, it's rooted in white patriarchy, where it really is sort of this logic, you know, logical, budget driven, form driven um, process where we're actually talking about for us to really rethink the infrastructure of the culture of our communities at its core is the way that we relate to each other. And yeah. so I. No, sorry, go ahead. No, keep going. No, no, no. <laughs> no, it was just as you were talking, it was just making me think about how, for me, a successful outcome on a project is, is less, and, and it's a running joke sometimes how, like, if I give a lecture, how little I show of a, a built form when I'm talking about a project, that to me, what is, like, richer about a project is, like, at some point recognizing that I will leave a situation and it can't, what has held in terms of relationships can't be the relationship between the like sort of paying client and the community client and, and and each of them having a relationship with me but not one another right like so that a successful project to me is if i have built a relationship and helped nurture a relationship between those folks who will go off into the sunset together right and so that when I think about some of the more successful moments in a project, it's not the cool thing that can go in my portfolio, right? It's the moment where I saw that relationship working or I saw a moment of, of trust made visible. And that that tells me that like I've contributed to the building blocks that actually could chart a different future. Yeah. And I think that's where we need to start making visible a lot of that labor, right? And I think that's why collaborations with community leadership or, you know, residents become so important because, you know, trust building isn't something that we can write on our resume. I think I think we should in terms of skills because it, it truly is like, it's an art, right? You, you It's an expertise um, to be able to um, foster a sense of, of, of vulnerability with other people, but it takes time. Um, it often doesn't work in linear time on a, you know, you can't put it on a Gantt chart or a project schedule and, and you just don't know. And I think this is where a lot of, hopefully the, the pandemic has re, has shaken everything or burned everything to the ground, you know, where, where we can't force things, right? We also can't force relationships with community partners if it's not there, right? Um, we also walk into, I know from, I don't, I, you know, I don't want to speak for you, but, you know, there's some community context where I walk in and, you know, there are three generations prior to me of sort of design harm. And I have um, actually little understanding of sort of some of the conversation that that's, that's happening. Um, what is, you know, beginning to reassess like what my, my role is or, you know, my, what my non-role should be has actually been a big part of the way that um, this begins to, I think, emerge in the context of, of professional, professional realm. And so I think one of the things that I think could be helpful to talk about is how is this integrated in an in intentional way in our design process? Um, because, you know, it, I, for me, I've been doing this work for 15 years and a lot of it was you know, I have stumbled, I have, I have gone home and cried and felt like, you know, I have zero agency, or I shouldn't even be in the room, um, or, you know, feeling overwhelmed, because I'm so, so loved and received by community members, um, it's sort of all over the place. But a lot of the work that we're doing, um, I know, for me, I've learned on the spot, because there has never been sort of a, the, I don't know, a, a course on, on deep relationship building um, in architecture school, right? Yeah, but and, 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 and in life, 
you yeah. too, right? Like the, I don't think the skills that we are talking about are specific to our architecture. I actually think they're specific to being a better human being. <laughs> and so, you know, there's there's no course in this and and anything that I've seen um, that you are taught regularly. I think both you and I have a pretty active practice of seeking out learning within this. And you know, there was a couple of things that you said that really struck me. I think one. Um, the, the whole time thing, I think, is super important because in in capitalist time, there there's no space to do this intimate conversation as we have talked about. And so, um, you know, both you and I, you know, one of the courses we have sought out, we're, we're taking a course by this amazing thinker, Bio Komalafe, right now. And he has this line about these times are urgent, let us slow down, right? And, um, you know, I think this idea of how do you sleep, how do you operate in slow time, or the time of trust, is is something that that both you and I incorporate into our, our practices. And I think that's not to say I don't have a client who will come at the beginning and say, "So here's when I foresee concept design happening, schematic design, design development, etc." And I usually like nod and then like, "Okay," and then just accept that like part of the work is to help everybody understand that if we have identified our goal as delivering um, long-term sustained benefit and healing and thriving to communities, that that timeline is completely un unworkable, but it's almost like a process of retraining, mm -hmm. right? Or, or I would almost say like stripping down mm -hmm. and then building back up in this new language, which is just a slower process in which I am not always successful <laughs> at. Um, and then I think the other thing that is connected to that is, um, and it speaks to something you said, is really owning what our complicity mm. is. Mm. And I think in many ways, you know, I have said in a couple academic lectures that I've given this year that I was trained to be a white supremacist. Mm. Like in my normal, in the normal training of what I was taught, you're supposed to do as an architect, it was basically perpetuating white supremacy. And I was taught not to question that. Um, and even if clearly someone who looks like me and does not want to create those kinds of things, that is not a thing I did intentionally, but I was complicit in, in creating that for many of the projects that I did early in my career. And it has been a slow and steady process to come to terms with the ways in which I have been complicit and, and still am sometimes, right? And then unlearning that particular complicity and harm and trying to challenge myself to figure out, well, how could I be complicit in healing, mm. right? I, I, I also am under no illusions that I'm a savior and I'm past, and that I, the thing is I will do will create a panacea. I know there's so much structure, but that does not negate my responsibility to be complicit in healing. And so I think there is something interesting about like, and, and maybe this goes back to our beginning definition of intimacy that both you and I had, which was often about locating ourselves in the conversation of intimacy. And so there is an active practice that I hold for myself of questioning my actions mm -hmm. and sort of saying, was that complicit in harm or was that complicit in healing? And if I am to make good on my desire to be intimate with the folks that I am building these relationships with, what is my responsibility? Mm -hmm. How am I holding myself accountable? How am I supporting them to hold me accountable? Um, and, I, and I will explicitly, like literally say to folks, like, I actually want, need you to tell me when I have done something that does not meet our agreement. Mm -hmm. Like I am giving an open invitation and telling you that I will receive it. And I think that's also an important thing in this idea of like, what does it mean to create intimacy? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I think sort of a um, something that keeps reemerging is like the toggling back and forth between like the individual experience and the collective experience. And so if we want to really think about how design can address generational healing within the context of, let's say, you know, displacement or a community, what they have experienced. I know for me, if you know, I, I've, I've spent a lot of time just really addressing my own sort of core childhood wounds, but also, you know, challenges that I've experienced and also honest with myself of like, I am also a site of brokenness. Like I'm also a site of deep, that needs deep healing and also going through the process of resourcing myself, but also understanding of what I actually need in order to, um, 
to, to feel um, a sense of just wholeness or being resourced enough to then, you know, support another community. For me, that's the only way that I can actually authentically show up. And so there, there was a moment where I was like, I, I am just a mess right now. And I, I just have zero capacity to, to be able to hold um, this type of emotional space for a community that has experienced so much harm because like right now I am just as just as harmed. And so um, I think one of the things that I have been really trying to um, commit to as a process is if I don't have an embodied experience of sort of a, um, a conversation or a strategy and you know, pushed it through my own lived experience, then I don't feel equipped enough to actually facilitate a conversation about that um, on, a, on a collective scale. And so I think that's why a lot of lateral partnership has also emerged where I'm like, you know what, I have, um, I have never been unhoused. That is not a lived experience of mine. For me to um, start understanding, um, you, I loved how you brought up proximity in the very beginning, but also being really explicit about what's my proximity, not only to the issue at hand, uh, but also to the relationship building that needs to happen also becomes a part of this, I think, emotional infrastructure that we're trying to build um, within sort of like the physical improvements that we want to see in the built environment. And so I think a lot of times the design industry tries to center the design, um, the design expertise as a way of organizing, right, the way people relate to each other. And I think a lot of times that that is actually inappropriate. And so being able to think about how do we, you know, scaffold or, um, you know, just, you know, the, the appropriate proximity, I think, um, to the people and place um, becomes also a skill that takes time to refine over time. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I also think with, you know, building on that thread, it's opening up myself and the team and the client who's paying to also like honor that there is wisdom and expertise on the side of those who are most impacted by what is about to happen um, and creating space for that. And also knowing that part of creating space is honoring that oftentimes they have either been willfully or unintentionally ignored, neglected, silenced harms before so that there is a reluctance on like sharing that, right? Like if I just giving some honor and value to the fact that whenever you were asking someone to share a, their story, a piece of their story, to share their opinion, to share what has happened to them, that that is a huge ask. Mm -hmm. And that I need to come in with as much humbleness and um, as much appreciation for what it means for that to be shared with me and set the turn, set up the conditions that makes it feel safe enough. I'm not going to say safe, but safe enough mm -hmm. to, to share that. But that is part of the what we mean by creating proximity, right? Like for us to get in touch with it, there's also responsibility for us to make sure that like it is safe enough to be shared. And you think if you were to think about any situation where like you are going and you're meeting somebody new or you're coming into a new group and part of making the group work is like, talking about yourself, like we all would assess that situation and say, does this thing feel like a safe enough place for me to be able to share some of my deepest and darkest <laughs> desires and thoughts, right? Like, and if it doesn't, then we wouldn't share. And then that group cannot move on with the benefit of our contributions. And so I think about that a lot. And I think about being really clear for myself, am I personally contributing to the setting up of those conditions that makes it safe enough to, to, to share. And that means like, it's not a checklist, right? Like I think one of the things that, and I, I, I speak for you, but I imagine given some of our conversations that this has happened to you of this like checklist bullshit form of community engagement, right? Like that we did the community meeting, so we should be good. We let them have stickers and dots, so we should be good. Um, and not actually saying, but did we build relationships? Did we make it safe enough for them to share what they what they want? Did we honor that they may have shared with other folks or even people who looked like us in the past and been disappointed and actually harmed even further? And so if we're not holding space for the entirety of that, again, I don't know how we create good work. Yeah. 
No, I think so many times people will jump into this sort of um, attempted co-creative process, right? And I think a lot of times at its at its worst, it's extractive and at its best, it'll be uh, transactional where it's just sort of like, here are these stickers, tell us what is your, what, what do you want without doing that buildup of like, how is, how are you, first of all, just in a moment where you can actually think about creativity and, and be generative, right? Like, how are you? Like, who is showing up today, right? Can all, all your pieces be in the room? And so again, this like self-determined sense of safety. And so um, I know in some of the converse, collective conversations we've had, we've talked about what happens when you are when you are activated to the point of, you know, you're shutting down. And we actually start conversations with how do we resource ourselves to bring us back, right? So. I love the fact that we're both mindfulness practitioners and we can bring some of those skills to the table of like, when you feel like you can't actually listen to a neighbor or talk about it, you know, what are ways that you can actually calm yourself down so that you can remain open? So I think this idea of like, how do you create personal safety in, in, a, in, a, in a collective space becomes first and foremost that, mm -hmm. again, a lot of times, I think a lot of design professionals, well, let's be honest, don't have the skills to do. Yeah. But then I think this idea of ethical engagement of, you know, what are the agreements, right? What are the interactions that I'm going to consent to that I feel comfortable ab about? Like, what is this co-created proximity that I feel I can love myself and love you at the same time? Like, you know, you the Prentice Hempel quote that you were saying. And I think a lot of times this builds then up to that co-creative process that I think a lot of times designers just want to jump into because we're, we're taught so often this visioning process is design, but all of this infrastructure, this emotional cultural infrastructure that now needs to be built in order to achieve this level of, you know, more deepened connection, which will, I think, allow the imagination to actually feel spacious and, and be able to feel expansive, isn't in, in the time frame, which, you know, what I've learned is 75% of sort of the heavy lifting. And yeah. sometimes that looks like one-on-one -on -one conversations with community leaders over the course of months. Sometimes it means like, you know, hosting dinners, um, I, you know, I don't know over time, but I think really beginning to, or, you know, also just being real and being like, you know what, this is not a community that I'm embedded with. I should not be doing this work, but I know someone who should. And, you know, yeah. not actually removing ourselves from the process because, you know, that, that proximity, again, what is appropriate um, um, isn't, isn't necessarily there. So I think when we, for me, when I talk about what um, how architecture begins to shift as we begin to try to design for collective intimacy. It's less about sort of the vi visioning, but but the, the the conditions and the foundations that we need to lay in order to um, the soil, right? Yeah. What is like yeah. the fertile ground that we need in order for those seeds to begin sprouting? Totally. And you know, I think that um, I mentioned in a talk. Re uh, a while ago about this idea of approaching when I'm engaging communities of thinking of challenging myself to like, how am I building a sacred relationship, right? And I think there's something you know, in that that is about like this, the honor that I hold in terms of being able to do that. Um, and that it's not, I'm engaging community to figure out what they need to see in that park that we're supposed to design, right? But like first and foremost, my commitment is to the sacredness of this relationship. And that if that doesn't happen, then we've, we've got nothing. And so there is a story sometimes tell of, um, in one of my projects, I was um, doing some initial meetings with um, community and it, um, there was one woman who had been an activist and I had sort of gotten to her through her husband and I was supposed to talk to them together. And she really did not want to talk to me because she was like, who the hell are you? You were just another <laughs> in a long list of folks who have come and said they're going to do something and then they don't end up doing anything. So really, why should I be trusting you? Why should I be trusting you with the story of my life, with the story of my family and what's important to me? So I'll tell you how we fought fought to get this piece of land, but I ain't telling you anything else. And so, because when I engage in this, I treat it like, it's like I'm building, a, it would be the same principles I would use when I built the friendship with you, right? Like what are the conversations I'm gonna have with you to get to know you? Not to sort of say, well, I need to become friends with Teresa or I have Teresa in my camp 
so we can go and be activists together at the GSD, right? Like it was like, no, I want to know this person <laughs> because if I'm going to be in community with them, if I'm going to build solidarity with them, I have to know this person at an intimate level. And so that's how I treated this conversation with this, this woman. And by the end of, you know, even that initial conversation, she was like showing me pictures of her grandbabies and telling me stories about them. And I continued, she continued coming to events at this project. And I would always like make sure I took time to talk to her and not sort of saying, hey, have you contributed to giving us your input of what you want to see? It was like literally checking in and building off of that first conversation. How are you grandbabies? What's going on? How are you feeling? And I remember like maybe a year, year and a half after this, I ran it, I, I ran into her at a community event that wasn't a, aligned with our project. But I think one of the other things of sort of saying you're going to get engaged in a community is that you're also not being transactional and thinking that the only things you do in that community are when it has to do with your project, but that you're showing up to be a part of the community full stop. And that means participating in other folks' events. So I was there. I actually did not have that long I could stay, but I wanted to at least show my my face and support. And I ran into her, but she was really unhappy. And um, you know, I think the other part of being able to be in a place of intimacy is that you can see a person as who they really are. So it's not just like, oh, there's Brenda, and I'm like moving on. It's like, oh, there's Brenda, but she's really unhappy. Like I can see there's a difference in her light. And so I just asked what was wrong, and it was the anniversary of her son being murdered and she just really needed to talk to somebody and so I just I you know I had a place to go but I was like that's not important but this this is and you know that is not the first time that I have missed another meeting or missed the thing I was supposed to do for my work because I was sort of like if I'm in relationship with someone then I have the spaciousness to hold space for what they need right now mm -hmm. and that is my contribution to the building of our relationship and so I think that just, I, I say that story just to sort of say that like getting out of our heads of like, these are the standard pieces of process, whether it's an engagement process or a design process and just sort of saying, what is, what should be the default practices as a human being? Yeah. And that's all we're asking for here. We're not trying to create this grand new thing that has never before existed. We're just sort of saying, how are we all more human and relating to one another as part of that? And that that's the only way that we create these places that are fully healed and that allow for intimacy to exist and that celebrate and honor that everybody should have a right to a place that like believes in their story. And so I know. Should we leave? Yeah, I was going to say, should we open up for questions since we only have a... Uh, Maria? Hi, I'm back. <laughs> I was listening so intently, I lost track of time myself. <laughs> that was amazing. I just wrote down relationshipness equals spaciousness. I mean, there's something so amazing about the idea of making space for that relationship. And we have a bunch of questions. Oh, we have, well, we have one I want to ask, but I had a question myself. I, and you answered it with that. It was, um, you know, in our, uh, in this world of a traditional design process, how do we make space to create those relationships? And it is, you answered it just now by saying, it's just simply by being a human being and just by being present and being um, available to uh, your clients and to the community and to whoever you are, you, you know, engaging with in that process. So um, I just found that just so helpful to understand what it really means. I have a bunch of questions here myself, but I'm going to jump to um, this really great one that Bonnie Phillips put into the chat. And she wrote intimacy slash with ourselves, with each other and with the planet Earth is vitally critical today. Can this process, the needed change that you're speaking about, can it take place peacefully from a capitalist situation to one that is more equitable? That's a great question. Bonnie Phillips from the Golden Rule Project. Either of you want to take that one? Do you want to start or you want me to start? <laughs> it's pretty, pretty loaded. Can you do a, a quick start? I mean, I think for me, 
Um, over the course of quarantine, I have like sort of re recorded my intimate relationship with Mother Mother Earth right. um, in in a really deep way because you know almost took for granted being outside. Right again, it's the status quo where once we couldn't, um, I started to realize like how important it was, and so. Um, the process of treating my my walk in the morning as a true walking meditation with, you know, with the soil, with the birds, with the trees, um, and actually really truly understanding what it means to have them as, as, as our ancestors, as the people that, you know, as, as, as the land that has nurtured us, right? Without it, we couldn't exist. So for me, I, I went through a process of really, and I, I'm still continuing to rebuild um, what my relationship is um, with the land and what it means to heal from it, but then also heal with. Um, and, and I think this is going to continue to be sort of a, a lifelong process. Yeah, I agree. And I think, um, you know, I definitely have come to see my purpose is not only healing our relationship with the land, but that like as a precursor, we have to also heal our relationship with each other. So the land is kind of intimate to how I think about things. And um, in my definition, I said others and probably should have been more explicit by that. I meant other beings, like not just human beings, but all, all kind all of others. beings, including the land. And um, one of the, um, I, I study with a, a Buddhist teacher, Norma Wong, and um, she was telling us in one of our teachings, a um, native Hawaiian word called Palina. And it basically means you are not separate from. And I feel like I use this really as a mantra for everything and how I understand both like what are the decisions I'm making, what are the impacts of those decisions is really you are not separate from. And I mean, and I think that is like other beings, it's, it's other humans in the land. And if we actually saw ourselves in a state of interdependence, I think we would make different decisions. And I think when we talk about intimacy, it is about getting to a place where we can hold that interdependence dependence as just is like it's not a special thing it just right, right. Is, right? um yeah. and then the only other thing i would mention to what she had um bonnie's um questions it also talked about like peacefulness and the capital situ situation we're in and moving to more equitable one i don't actually think it's peaceful or it's going to be peaceful because i think we're fundamentally stripping ourselves down and if we think even of this idea of like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. It sounds really cute, but that is not a gentle process, right? It is melting to be reconstituted. And so I think that we have to prepare ourselves for that there is a struggle to come to shift from this place that we're articulating that we would love to see us in and where we are now. Um, right. And the point is not to run from that struggle, but mm -hmm. to build a system of intimate relationships that you can have a community with, right. with which you can struggle together. Right, yeah. We have another question that came in in the Q&A part of it. It's really great too. Um, Nazra, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong. Her question is how do we move this more into traditional practice? Though participatory design and community-based design is more prevalent, how do we scale it up and shift from the small subset of the professions? She's asking as someone in a traditional practice thinking about a transition. I can start and then. Okay. <laughs> so a couple of thoughts. One, I actually um, sometimes see parallels of what has been happening with the community engaged design space as what happened with sustainability 20 years ago. So if you think about 20 years ago, sustainability and design, there were like a few niche firms that did it, um, but everybody else kind of did the business as usual practice of architecture. And what was super significant in triggering a shift was that clients started demanding it. And wow. Architects basically, I don't, you know, some did it because they generally wanted to, but I think a lot did it because they realized that from a market perspective, they had to do it. Um, and so I'm sort of seeing a lot of clients who are asking for this now. Um, I had somebody reach out to me recently and say, oh, they got a project because a client 
put in the RFP brief my TED talk and sort of said that part of what people have to respond to is how they're addressing this. And so I think there is some that is coming from the, the, the market that is demanding that we do these kinds of things. And then the other thing that I would say is that, um, you know, I think if you already think about these things to be willing to be the one who's like holding space for these conversations in your practice, I think changing to this way of design is super scary for people who were trained in another way. And so it actually requires those who are willing to take the leap to hold space, to be able to bring those who are interested, but don't know where to start along. So think right. of yourself as an agent in helping to shift the practice. That's a really good advice. I mean, I, I think it's also about seeing your own life as the place of intervention and it not having to be through the design practice first. You know, So if you wanna deepen, um, your skills around relationship building, it's like to a place of, you know, authentic co-creation. For me, I do it. I'm like, how is my child a part of, you know, determining what their living environment is, right? What is the choice that's involved? Um, how do I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm building community with the neighbors down my street, right? Or, you know, in other beloved communities that I'm a part of. And so again, this is the piece of practice. Like, you're never going to, the first time you do something should never be at a public forum, right? I think that is actually careless and harmful. Yes. Um, it should be within yourself, or within um, your family, because relationship building, they're mistakes, right? We actually haven't talked about conflict, but right. relationship becomes conflict. And when you care so much about a person or a community, the ability to get your feelings hurt or to feel, you know, any type of damage is just as great. And so it's also creating that resiliency to be able to repair and address something. It's like, oh, this was a misunderstanding. How do we untangle this and really get at what the core was? What, what was the mismatch of needs? And I feel like if you can't have these types of conversations with, you know, dear friends, as you're trying to, um, you know, rebuild a community garden on your corner, right? Which is a place right. where you can also be like, oh, I actually didn't listen to anyone else. And I just planted all the, all the radishes. Nobody wanted radishes like, oh. Right. Right. And so I think rather than always thinking about your job being a place of transformation, how are you actually doing that within your household first? And then through that embodied practice, you can begin scaling it up. And can I offer up just a quick, um, yesterday, Teresa and I were both on a call to discuss something and like, it was not the smoothest discussion, right? There's a little bit of tension and conflict. And then we checked in with each other afterwards to be like, hey, I know that was a bit hard. I just wanna check if you're okay and know that this is not any, this is not about my lab. It's just like, this is, this is what I was trying to hold. And it, I appreciated it. Teresa like responding back. It's like, no, and I can see where you are. And we were like, we're good, right? We're not holding anything. And so I think that that's, that's what Teresa is talking about in terms of like, it can't just be about the external work. Like it also has to be in these like relationships you have in your personal life. There is no line, right? right. Like it, right. it is all through line. Yeah, and that actually, there's another really great question, I think, and you both are almost already speaking to that. Oh, from Gregory, can you see that? what personal yeah. example for family friend supports do you need in order to accomplish what well, Liz um, was talking about in terms of community relationship building. It's basically what you're saying, right? Totally. And I, I, I think it's like taking advantage of all of these small opportunities, like that simple text exchange, right? To right. build the muscle around it is really important. And if you can do it with people that you are already in relationship with, like that almost de-risks the situation, right? right. After after 20 years of friendship, I know Teresa loves me. So like, I wasn't like super afraid that I had like <laughs> stepped out of line, but I wanted her to know that I like, I value a relationship and I value that that conflict was important. And I want us to make sure that there's no lingering issues with that tension. And I think, you know, I will say personally that my therapist is also key <laughs> to me, right? Yeah. Because, it, you know, speaking to what Teresa had said earlier about this need to make sure you're working on yourself and you're working through your issues. And I have several like circles of friends that hold space for me to like 
be my, uh, my perfectly imperfect self with and continue my evolution with so that when I do show up in these communities that I'm not dropping my baggage for them to carry. Right, right, yeah, yeah, I mean, this is amazing. We have a minute left to, to wrap this up. I, I just, maybe if you could leave us with some closing thoughts, both of you, Teresa, first. For me, one of the things that I, I was the first and foremost thing I learned when I took a trauma-informed um, parenting class was how do you lead with curiosity? Right. right. So if you receive a comment or feedback and sort of the, the eight-year-old you wants to be like, no, that's not true. Don't be mean to me, right? That's a that's a response rooted in, in sort of a fight mechanism. But instead right. leading with curiosity, being like, actually, what is actually underneath here? How can this be an opportunity for, for, for me, the question is always, um, how do I deepen connection and, and continue growth, right? For me, those are two of the, the spaces that I'm constantly searching for. So- The beautiful, um, it's beautiful. Lead with curiosity. <laughs> Liz, oh, we, have, we have 30 seconds, I'm so sorry. No, that's, uh, I would just, I, I can't say it better than the leading with curiosity. I think it's like that every human being desperately wants to be able to share their story and have it be valued. And so what are you doing that to not only do it for yourself, but to do it for everyone who is right. in community with you? Right. And, and in the spirit of concluding this talk, and this is not a one and done, and continuing our relationships that we have just now started, all of us together, uh, on this Zoom face-to-face -face and all of those that are online listening, please follow Teresa and Liz and their work and, um, and at our work at the center and stay in touch with us if you have thoughts or, or um, would like to continue this conversation. This was amazing. Thank you so much. And we are, you know, our Jane Jacobs lectures continue into the new year. So please join us for those. Teresa, Liz, all of you on this call, stay with us and we'll stay with you. And I'm just so, I'm so inspired. I want a wonderful talk to like end our 21 year of <laughs> that was and to, to move forward. You, you both were just truly so inspiring. I have pages of notes written all over here that I'm going to share with all of my students. So um, it, with, with all of our gratitude from the Center for the Living City, thank you so very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.